uh, we have a team, uh, one of who is going to help me uh, uh, do this presentation. So Valentine is one of our research scientists. Geoffrey Maranga is our senior hepatologist, uh, is listening in. Fredika Angote is also one of our snake handlers. Uh, and because we, snakes uh, are living animals and they need veterinary care, we have uh, veterinarians on board, Dr. Robert, Dr. Jacob, and uh, Dr. Henry. Um, the reason we, uh, just briefly before you proceed, uh, the reason we, we, we think we are going into uncharted territories in Kenya is because now we are having, uh, uh, mostly snakes around Kenya have been kept for touristic purposes and uh, understand as pets as well, uh, if they have the permits. But then now comes in us who are keeping snakes for 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 research purposes, and uh, uh, the animal welfare comes into question and how we are taking care of them. Are they being kept uh, in uh, the best husbandry conditions? Uh, are we pro uh, providing them with the with their with their basic needs, even as we as we keep them in captivity? And that's really the going to constitute mostly the, the, the presentation that uh, uh, Robert will uh, present today. Next slide. So I'll hand over to Robert, who will do uh, a brief introduction. And uh, just uh, uh, because he's mostly the one who does the practice. So it was best that I let him talk on this. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Afternoon, everyone. So uh, I'll go through the presentation as started by Dr. George. Uh, and after the presentation, all questions will be welcomed, clarifications and maybe contributions to the same. And I'll be assisted by Dr. Jacob, Dr. Henry and Geoffrey, our chief pathologist in answering the questions. So basically rept reptiles are called blooded vertebrates in the class reptilia, usually covered with scales or bony plates. This, there are many species in this class. Uh, some of the orders include Chelonia, which basically includes the turtles and the tortoises, Crocodilia, which includes the crocodiles, Rhinocephalia, which includes the tortoises, and Squamata, which basically includes the lizards and the snakes, which are our species of interest today. So these are our representative images of turtle, tortoise, Crocodile and the Tuatara. So, why are we learning reptile medicine? As uh, Dr. Ari stated, uh, there's a dire need to, to actually improve our knowledge on reptile medicine because uh, reptiles are being kept as pets on, the, on an increasing rate and uh, they are being used for research purposes like dietary, educational purposes like this uh, platform, and conservation programs. And then uh, they are also used for captive breeding and sale, and they are also there in pet trade. So when we learn more about triple medicine, you are actually able to uphold their welfare and their rights in terms of health and uh, yeah, their welfare, and as well as control for zoonotic diseases, which are which can be transmitted from the snakes to the humans. So snakes are legless vertebrates, and we have many species, thousands of species, approximately 3,100. And most of them are actually non-venomous. So only a few, about approximately 300 species are, uh, are venomous. And then they come in a variety of sizes and shapes, with the largest one being over 10 meters, and that's the python. Allow me to go through the anatomy and physiology of of snakes in a nutshell. Uh, regarding the apical cavity, they have six rows of teeth, four in the maxilla, the upper jaw that is, and uh, two in the mandible. And then they lack true eyelids, and uh, that is the sense of sight and uh, sense of, of smell. But then they are they are blessed with this with their tongue, which is actually uh, has a diverticulum into two two. Let me see. Yeah. If you can see the, the image at the top right, their tongue has a reticulum into two separate tongues. And then they have a Jacobson's organ, 
which actually is their chest muscle, houses their chest muscle. So normally what happens, snake use their tongue for the sense of, um, actually to sense their vicinity, that is the surrounding and the smell. So they constant, constantly extrude their tongue, they get the senses, and then they, they take back their tongue into the Jacobson's organ, which actually processes the senses. So whenever a snake is following a prey, so the, the, the tongue, as you can see, has a right and a left diverticular. So whenever it's following a, a prey, the respective diverticular vibrates more, so that allows it to actually be conscious of the movement of the, of the, of the prey, or rather the threat as well. So the, uh, they have one functional lung, which is usually the right one, and there's no diaphragm. The stomach and the liver are cruciform, just like all the reptiles, and they, are, they have a gallbladder as well. The pancreas is adjacent to the duodenum, and the spleen may be attached to the pancreas. Handling and uh, physical examination of snakes. Uh, to begin with, the right picture, the picture the right side of the screen, just showcases some of the hooves, and maybe the tongues, the snake handling equipment that we have at the apatherium, that is the gastric apatherium. And why would, what would warrant for physical examination or rather handling of captive snakes? So maybe you want to perform routine management like cleaning, feeding. Some snakes actually have, uh, exhibit anorexia, maybe due to, due to some underlying conditions which I'll go through later. So they warrant for forceful feeding. Maybe you want to perform routine management practices like screening for infections. So we take blood smear from the coccygeal vein, and then we perform diagnostic techniques like uh, radiography, physical examination, cranial cordal, which I'll go through later on. Yeah, and uh, most of these procedures don't warrant for use of anesthesia. But then literature, uh, literature prohib prohibits the use of barbiturates. Normally, uh, we, we haven't found, unless it's, it, 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 it requires dye intervention in terms of a surgical intervention, normally we don't use, we just use a physical restraint by the help of a pathologist. So for physical, physical restraint, uh, this is the procedure of physical restraint. We have our pathologists, there are two of them handling the snakes. So when, 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 when handling a snake, we first restrain the hair using the appropriate tool. And then after restraint of the head, you use your thumb and the middle finger to get hold of, of the snake just posterior to the capitals, that is the head. And then your index finger placed on top of the head to, for easier manipulation. The, the one handling the head will only focus on the anterior side, while the assistant or pathologist will help handle the caudal aspect. This is because snake um, use their have have musculature along their body, so they have these undulating contractions, which can be really powerful and can actually destroy your your grip. So you can let go the snake, or maybe maybe it can affect the grip that you're you're having on the anterior side. That is actually why it is important to have an assistant a pathologist who holds there on the posterior side. And these pathologists have their way of coordination in the sense that after restraining the, sn the snake, they move in a coordinated manner with the caudal one always being on the caudal aspect and the anterior person always being on the cranial aspect. So as you can see from the points, that is just sort of explained. The head of the snake is held behind the occiput, using thumb and middle finger to support the lateral aspect of the cranium. The index finger is placed on the top of the head and the other hand is used to support the body. So we always work in tools, as I've stated. General approach, this is the general examination uh, in case of disease or maybe the routine examination that we have. As you understand, these are research animals and they, it is core, even if it's not research, if it's, it is core for the purpose of animal welfare and upholding animal rights to constantly check on their, on their health and welfare conditions. So what we do, we do, we, we do the simple cranial to caudal, that is head to the, to the caudal aspect of the animal approach. We first look at the check for abnormalities in the head, including the swelling, the cranial, the buccal cavity for mouth rash and any discharges, any other wounds, maybe presence of 
external parasites like ticks and mites. And this can be, if it's not uh, evident, it can be actually informed by the, the peeling of the scales. Depending upon, max, upon the musculature feeding habits and fat reserves of the snake, it may be possible to palpate the normal heart, stomach, liver, uh, active ovaries, the active ones, to be specific, eggs, kidney, and fecal material. So uh, to my right is an image of a snake uh, post-feeding, just after feeding. So normally they, they feed, let's say they fed on, on mice, they, they, they ingest the, the entire mouse. So they can even take two or five, depending on the size of snake. So they take, they take them in whole and you can actually, it's actually visible in the other parts of the body through swelling. And it's advisable at this moment, just let the snake be in peace and um, in an isolated environment. Don't, don't handle the snake at this point because you are risking regurgitation of the food. So that's just the first point is just what I explained. Recently fed snakes will have a, a mid-body swelling, but handling such individuals may well lead to regurgitation. Eggs and pre-ovulatory follicles can be palpated from the abdominal aspect. Clinical examination should differentiate between colonic internal and subcutaneous masses. Normally sub subcutaneous masses like, uh, like, uh, like uh, tumors, yeah, and, uh, and other growings and maybe swellings. Uh, when you palpate and you want to differentiate between uh, a mass that is within the body cavity and that, 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 that is uh, on the subcutaneous, the subcutaneous mass is, is well confined and it's normally not, uh, uh, what can I use? It doesn't move compared to the internal structures. So the, 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 the subcutaneous mass is confined and it, it can't move easily. It, it is not easily palpable. It's just confined in a, in a, in a, in a specific location. Majority of subcutaneous masses are, are usually abscesses, but parasitic cysts, blisters, and euplas are occasionally seen. For the case of abscess, you just lance using a, a sterile scalpel blade. You, you make a slit and lance the entire mass. We'll go through that later on. Internal masses may represent abscesses, neoplasia, granuloma, gran, granulomas, obstipation, or other constipation PR can, or also can be there, organ hypertrophy and retain eggs or over. They can as well be the normal internal structures in the viscera. So these are continuation of the examination. Uh, writing reflex is very important, especially when we are concentrating on the on the neurology aspect or the nervous system. Uh, writing reflex is whereby when you place a snake or when a snake, a snake is loose, it goes back to its original position. So proprioception, proprioception, which is used to advise on the writing reflex, is important when you are checking for neurological signs or other neurological abnormalities. Sick snakes will always observe, just like the birds uh, showcase the sick bird syndrome, sick snakes will always observe, uh, showcase the, the sick syndrome, such as lack of strength, anorexia, that is they don't have appetite, and then they are not active. So normally when you, when you give them, the first indication that we get, apart from less activity, inactiveness of the snake, Normally when we feed them, we expect in the morning when we come back or within a certain time frame, if it's within the daytime, we expect them to have fed on the, on the provided feed. So if the snake hasn't fed on, this, on, the, on the provided maybe mice or chicks, that is the first indication. Because the normal behavior of a snake is to feed within a stipulated time period. Head carriage, body posture, clock, whole turn, when you pinch on the clock, there's always a tone proprioception that is advising on the writing reflex. Skin pinch that goes back to normal and can also advise on, uh, rather have uh, an indication on dehydration status of the animal. Withdrawal from food, ocular and writing reflexes can be used to assess neurological function. The entire integument is examined for, uh, for evidence of this of dyskinesis, which is uh, in maybe abnormal, abnormal shedding of the skin. As we all know, it's a normal behavior, or rather a normal routine for, for snakes to shed their skin. 
uh, after a specified time period. So we don't expect abnormal in the sense that it can either be an incomplete or rather incomplete in the sense that the skin is shed, but yes, still hanging halfway or rather shedding some portions of skin. The normal behavior is to share the entire skin slowly. Retain spectacles. Spectacles are the scales that surround the orbit of the eyes. Reason sh shed skin parasitism and microbiological infection. Skin tenting and ridges based on cachexia or dehydration. Cachexia is a less than normal body condition. Dehydration, while mites may congregate on in skin folds, nostrils, and ocular rims. The, the eye should be clear unless a disease is imminent. Unless the snake, normally during shedding of skin, which is a disease, this, the, the snake eyes change their color. So unless it's that, during that time, the, their eyes should always be clear. If not, then that should advise on, or rather be an indication of an Ill, Ill health. The spectacles should be smooth. Any wrinkles indicate presence of a retained spectacle. Blocked sub spectacular, spe spectacular fluid drainage causa sub spectacular swelling resulting in, a, in an abscess. Damage to underlying cornea results in panophthalmitis and ocular swelling. So when there is a damage to the underlying tissues of this of the cornea, the cornea is bulges outwards. So you, it's evident as a swelling while retrobulbar abscession will result in a protrusion of normal size globe. Examination of the oral cavity. After the hepatologist restrains the, the cranial part of the snake, that is the head, uh, we use an equipment. We can use, uh, we can use surgical equipment like hemostat, anything that you are comfortable with, and it's rigid in the sense that it can give you a good grip to open the, or rather extrude, extrude the mouth cavity. And uh, on the mouth cavity, you observe, observe for hemorrhage, that is bleeding, for, for mouth throat. Mouth throat uh, can be indicated by a thick mucus that can actually be confused as a hanging membrane. So uh, like just in the bovine, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a presentation of a thick hanging ropey, some, a small ropey mucus that can be confused as a membrane. That's always an indication of a mouth rash, or rather mouth rot, bleeding, and any other swelling. Examination of the oral cavity is often left until the end of examination, as many snakes objects object to such manipulation. The mouth can be gently opened using tongue depressor or blunt probe to assist to assess the mucus membranes, teeth, and glottis. So normally what happens, even in the case of severe mouth rot, we have these teeth loosening up and they can actually come out. The pharynx and the glottis should be examined for hemorrhage, foreign bodies, parasites, and discharges. Open mouth breathing is a reliable indicator of severe respiratory compromise. We know that snakes are, are, are cold-blooded. They adjust to the external environmental temperature. But then in condition, so it's upon, upon the conservationist or rather the herpetologist to ensure that the, the, the room where they're kept in has optimal temperature and humidity. So in the, like in, in such season where there is cold, if you don't consider that, you, you can actually get conditions such as pneumonia. And during pneumonia, the, a clear indication of dyspnea or, or or labored breathing in snakes is open mouth breathing. The cloaca basically should have muscle tone, as I stated, and not be gaping open, be free from fecal staining with no discharges. That is the normal scenario of a, or rather normal presentation of a healthy cloaca, unless there are conditions such as diarrhea, constipation, or mass in the cloaca. Nerva snakes will often expel the contents of their cloaca guns and cloaca in defensive reaction to perceived threat. And that is a defensive mechanism. So the, 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 the glands have a false smell, just like the anal glands in dogs. But then when, 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 when you smell, you should be able to differentiate that false smell from something that is infectious. 
that doesn't represent infection. Let's take the next point. Examination of the cloaca can be carried out using a dedicated otoscope and rigid endoscope. In small to medium snake, latex gloved lubricated finger can be passed into the cloaca and allow for palpation of eggs, colids, fecalis, or abscess. We've had a scenario of constipation in snake, and uh, normally during constipation, because uh, we didn't ac have access to the otoscope and the endoscope, uh, we used lattice, lattice gloves. So what we did, we palpated the abdominal cavity. We actually, uh, we actually palpated the obstructing mass, which the snake was trying so hard to push to, to, to expel the mass through the cloaca. This can lead to cases such as, uh, such as prolapse. And uh, we actually were in position to see during the straining the, the mass from the clerical end. So normally what you do in that scenario, you apply liquid paraffin that helps smoothen the, the cloaca and then slowly massage gently from anterior to posterior side, you gently massage the, extrude, the obstructing mass. And then you can use your small finger that is lubricated just to palpate on the cloaca and see where the obstructing mass is. Examination of the tail should confirm the gender. So as you can see on the right side, male tend to have a longer tail compared to the females. Now, what are the co some of the common diseases of captive snakes? We are talking of captive because we've interacted, we basically interact with captive snakes at case Cafeterium. So these are some of the diseases. They might not be all or exhaustive. The list might not be exhaustive, but we've experienced some, not all of the conditions, including the mouth rot, parasitism, skin infection, respiratory disease, inclusion body, septicemia, and dyslexis. Mouth rot, I've already explained, and uh, basically, mouth rot comes about as a as a sequel, or rather as a as a sequel to to underlying condition or immunocompromised snakes. Yeah. So, and uh, some of these stress that can subject them to mouth rot is, for instance, poor environmental conditions, not feeding the snake. Some snakes are really choosy, so not not feeding them with what they want. Some snakes prefer feeding on, on from literature, some snakes prefer feeding on live, live, live prey. And this live, live prey, like the rats, might actually fight and scratch some portion of their mouth, leading to an infection. Some snake, especially in captivity, when they are being fed on chicks and mice, it is very, very, very important, I emphasize, to check on the, on the health of this prey in terms of the, their parasitism as well, because they actually, like the mice, transmit these parasites to the snake, which can be really, really frustrating. And parasites can also lead to anemia, dehydration, and then can subject these uh, uh, snakes to immunocompromised. They can become immunocompromised, then leading to secondary infections like, the, like pneumonia, septicemia, Hysteroid diseases that I've seen personally is uh, pneumonia that was actually, uh, the snake had open mouth breathing, but likely enough we managed to treat it and it recovered. Inclusion body disease, septicemia. Septicemia, one of the easiest routes or other cause of septicemia is injuries, either through the mouth or the, or the external integument. So whenever there is a, an injury, that is a perfect route for, for pathogens. The, that is a route of entry for the pathogens, and then they colonize the system, and the and the snake falls with septicemia. This disease, as I mentioned, is abnormal shedding of the skin. So just to go through the conditions: in the, infectious stomatitis, mouth rot. This infection of the mouth that appears as a pinpoint hemorrhage on the gums, or excessive amount of thick mucus containing blood or pus in the mouth at the inside edge of, of the front of the mouth. As you can see, develops when stress weakens the snake's immune system and allow bacteria in the mouth to grow unchecked. And these are opportunistic bacteria. They are normally there in the, in the, in the, in the animal, the same way we have staphylococcus in our skin. So whenever the, the snake is subjected to injuries, we have open wounds, and then the, the snake 
attacks, immune system is weakened, this bacteria become op opportunistic. As the disease progresses, osteomyelitis may develop, teeth loosen up and fall out as I stated, open mouth breathing because of the, of the pain, I guess, and not eating. Normally snakes with, uh, with uh, mouth throat would warrant for, for, for forceful feeding from what I've seen. Bacteria frequently cultured from this lesion include aeromonas, pseudomonas, proteas, and citromata. This is a continuation of mouth throat. Stress from poor husbandry usually precipitates the problem. This problem may not be a primary disease, but may in some occasions be secondary to an injury to the mouth or to husbandry issues such as poor nutrition, improper environmental temperature or humidity, or even overcrowding. Requires treatment with injectable antibiotics and rinsing the mouth with antibiotic solutions. So normally what we do, we rinse it with iodine and give it uh, enrofloxacin injectable. But to avoid some of these conditions, it's actually easier. You try mimic the external environment of snakes, like put them in single cages that are big enough. You, 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 you put twigs in the cages that will represent the normal environment where they, they climb maybe trees. You put hiding boxes, hollow bamboos, so that they can actually hide during, even during uh, ecdesis. That will actually minimize on the stress. Oral, this is the treatment to mouth rot. Oral cavity should be flushed at least once daily with povidon iodine, 1% solution. It has been shown to work well. Topical antimicrobial ointment can be applied in advanced cases. And in advanced cases, sorry, injectable endofloxacin. An antibiotic at this dose is generated 5 to 10 milligram per kilogram body weight once a day for 10 days. An antibiotic effective against anaerobic bacteria such as clindamycin at 5 milligram per kilogram every 24 hours should also be included in the treatment regime. regime. Increasing the environmental temperature along with medical treatment will get, greatly increase the chances of recovery from this disease. Normally, it is very, very, very important to consider the temperature ranges of the herpetarium because temperature actually has a role to the digestion and basal metabolic rate of the, of the snake. When the temperature is low, the, digest, the digestive system of the snake seems uh, to be temper, tampered with. So even it can lead to other conditions like constipation because the feed will stay in the abdomen for long. It actually even interferes with their activeness their appetite, so on and so forth. Some workers recommend injectable vitamin C at 10 to 20 milligram per kilogram body weight, once a day single injection daily, intramuscular route, with an, as an aid to facilitate healing in case of mouth rot. Parasitism. Both internal parasites like the worms and coccidia and external parasites like ticks and mites are common. Often, especially when you, you are out in the field, uh, when you are lucky, you, you will observe some snakes with, the, with, with ticks. Often do not cause obvious signs, but are detected on routine physical examination and fecal tests. This is actually a, an advantage of routine examination of the snakes or routine management. May however cause diarrhea, breathing difficulties, regurgitation, swelling of the internal organs, itching, skin irritation, and anemia. Mouth infection caused by mites can transmit bacteria, causing infection and weight loss. So normally, so normally what happens uh, when snake uh, is subjected to internal parasitism, these parasites actually fight for nutrients, which the same nutrients, the snake, the same nutrients that the snake require. So number one, we will have cachexic or rather reduced body condition and inactiveness. This, this, this uh, parasites cause irritation of the wall of the intestines and that will subject them to diarrhea. And remember with diarrhea, we are losing both nutrients and fluids. So that is reduced body condition and dehydration. And the snake will therefore uh, be subject to immunocompromised. It, it will be immunocompromised. It will, it will be weak 
and any opportunistic bacteria that is a resident flora or rather a nominal a normal flora can actually harm the snake at this level. Even the parasites can cause something like uh, constipation. That happens a lot. So example of parasitic infections, just to mention but a few, cryptosporidiosis, which is a protozoal parasite that can infect snake and cause thickening of the stomach muscle. It appears as a round mid-body swelling from the outside of the snake impaired and causes impaired digestion, as I mentioned, vomiting and weight loss. So normally when the, when the, when the parasite is affecting the upper digestive system or rather the digestive tract, it subjects the, the snake to vomiting. And when it's on the lower, it subjects it to, to diarrhea. In both conditions, we actually experienced, we experienced reduced appetite or rather anorexia. Some snakes are infected but show no signs at all and shed this contagious parasite through their stool, exposing other susceptible snakes to infection. If you are practicing individual house caging and the maximum hygiene, you will actually avoid this point. You will avoid transmission of such from one snake to another. Any suspect snake should be quarantined because this disease, some of this can be contagious rather infectious, and any object or potential formite should be disinfected before transfer from, from cage to cage. So whenever the hepatologists are working on this, normally we start with the they start with the healthy snakes, and then when they get to the sick snakes, they actually change gloves and the equipments they are using in terms of the clothes they are using to clean the cages. They change them from snake to snake to minimize on, trans on transmission of diseases. Many species of acanthocephalans, cestos, nematodes, and trematodes infect snake as well. There are literally, there are literally hundreds of snake helminth parasites. Nearly all of these helminth parasites respond well to standard veterinary parasiticides. Deworming medications are deworming medications are administered to the snake either orally or through injection for the control of parasitic infections. Injections normally we, 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 use, uh, we use ivermectin, which has shown to work very well, especially for the control also of external parasites. The type of parasite identified determines the drug that is needed. Some parasite problems such as cryptosporidiosis may be difficult to treat. A number of ticks and mites are ectoparasitic on snakes. There are over 250 species of snake mite paras parasites alone. This is also one of the more common problems in snakes, external parasites, especially the mites that may even subject them to anemia when the condition is not intervened early enough. Most mites and ticks are found in areas where there is moisture and a place to hide. The eyes, mouth, throat, cloaca, are commonly parasitized. These parasites are easily transferred from one animal to another by contact, and the history will also will often include a new animal in the collection. So normally when we bring in a new animal, we put it on quarantine, subject it to constant uh, veterinary checkups. Even the apatologist, funny enough, this apatologist like our apatologist Geoffrey is even far much experienced because he has over 10 years. So they can, they can easily detect when a, a, snake, uh, a snake is ill at an early stages, even better than some of the veterinarians. So he's actually the one who has been training us on this uh, early detection and some of these management practices, as far as hands-on are concerned. Uh, puppy or kitten flea and tick spray can be gently applied with a moist cloth once a week. And for the internal parasites, you can use biotrim. Normally, we, we start with uh, weak, weak antibiotics, especially the ones that are given to poultry. The cage, bowl, and the hide box must be disinfected, and new animals need to be quarantined, as I stated. This cage, bowl, and hide box are, are placed there to, to improve on the welfare conditions, as I stated, to mimic the normal environmental conditions, rather than the external environment that the, the snake live in. Soaking of the snake daily in warm water is an excellent way to remove 
mites because they get chopped, but most must be accompanied by cleaning the environment. Injectable and ivermectin can be also be used to kill arthropod parasites of snakes. Canine product frontline, the normal fipronil that uh, is placed to control for fleas in, in dogs has shown success in killing mites and ticks, snakes. Skin infection, that is dermatite, dermatitis. Often seen in snakes and other reptiles kept in environment that are too moist and or dirty, because that is uh, uh, a rich media for infection, transmission of infection. Snakes may have red inflamed skin with numerous small blister-like lesions. These fluid-filled blisters may become infected with bacteria, and if not treated promptly, may progress to severe skin damage, septicemia, and death. Exactly. So these are uh, these lesions that are normal at the start. If the environment is dirty, number one, and if uh, the snake is not intervened early enough by the vet, this will act as a route for infection. The infection gets systemic, causing septicemia. And locally, because the skin, the, there's a lesion, the snake skin is damaged locally. Systemically, we have systemic infection, septicemia. And subsequently, if not intervened or when left for too long, may even cause death. Snakes kept in too dry conditions without adequate humidity may retain skin when they shed and develop bacterial infection of the skin from debris building up under the retained skin pieces. Management, proper environment, and hygiene. Oral and injectable antibiotics as well as topical therapy are needed if, if the, this disease is advanced. Respiratory tract infections. Most uh, respiratory tract infections in snakes are caused by bacteria, but also may be due to other organisms like parasites. I explained how parasitemia might lead to uh, pneumonia or other uh, respiratory infections through immunocompromise. Fungi or viruses. These infections may occur in conjunction with stomatitis. Snakes with these infections may have excess mucus in their mouth, nasal discharge, lethargy, that is loss of energy, loss of appetite or rather anorexia, wheezing. So wheezing is, a, is, is, is an indication rather a form of uh, labored breathing. Gargling sounds and open mouth breathing to mean the oxygen debt is high. Occasionally, environmental irritants can cause nasal discharge in snakes as well. So diagnosis of respiratory tract infections involve x-ray, blood tests, and cultures of nasal or oral discharge to isolate the specific bacteria or the culprit bacteria organism. Treatment, oral injectable antibiotics, and occasionally nose or eye drops. Severely ill snakes require intensive care, including fluid therapy and force feeding. Inclusion body disease, I haven't uh, experienced this yet, but uh, it's a viral disease of pythons and boas. Pythons are commonly symptomatic, boas are asymptomatic. They don't uh, exhibit this, the signs. The signs vary a lot, although this disease may affect respiratory or digestive tract. It is generally associated with the nervous system. Affected snakes cannot write them, themselves when placed on their back. That is the proprioception, the writing reflex that I talked about getting back to its normal position. May appear to be stargazing, looking upwards, and may be paralyzed. Infectious inclusion body disease is contagious from snake to snake and is typical, typically fatal. As you can see this image, uh, proprioception, you have a negative writing reflex and a negative proprioception in this snake. It seems abnormal. Some, some body part uh, seems to be dorsally upright. Other, the ventral aspect is dorsal because uh, of the inclusion body disease affecting the nervous system. Snakes with inclusion body disease are euthanized as there is no cure. Strict quarantine of new animals is a must to prevent this. Boas and pythons should be housed separately so as not to allow seemingly normal boas, the, the normal ones that may be carrying this potential, potentially fatal infection to spread it to more susceptible pythons. Septicemia, 
condition in which bacteria and the toxins they produce proliferate in the bloodstream and other body organs. That is the definition. Snakes with septicemia are critically ill and often near death. This is because when the infection gets to the blood, the blood actually transmits the infection to literally all body organs, literally all, and a susceptible organ will be subjected to the infection. So the, 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 the snakes will be critically ill. They exhibit lethargy, they don't have energy, lack of appetite, open mouth breathing, especially when it gets to the respiratory system, and often have a red discoloration to the scales of their bellies. Septicemia requires aggressive treatment, antibiotics, involving antibiotics, fluid therapy to clear the toxin and to re the animal, force feeding to give the snake energy because they don't feed, are needed in attempt to save the snake. If you leave the condition to progress for so long, the prognosis then gets to grave. It's hard to, to save the snake. This, like, this is, refers to incomplete or retained shed. A common problem that may be secondary to low immunity, poor, poor, sorry, poor nutritional status and underlying disease process. Snakes should be soaked in warm water, water as stated earlier for up to an hour and the retained skin carefully removed piece by piece. You actually help them to shed their skin slowly and gently. This can be accomplished by placing the snake in a covered plastic container with one to three inches of warm water. Special care should be taken in the ocular regions where the retained spectacles exist. So this is a, a snake shedding its skin. Multiple retained spectacles can lead to infection and even blindness because they have a bacteria or other pathogens on the underneath. The best approach is to moisten the eyes with warm water and use a pair of fine jeweler forceps to elevate some scales peripheral to the eyes and then gradually remove the attached lens caps. Snakes with retained spectacles frequently will not feed, creating a vicious cycle and perpetuating the demise of the animal. Other diseases, their thermal burns. So reptiles normally, because they are cold blooded, they're attracted to heat. But this, uh, you may not realize that they are, uh, they may not realize, realize that they are getting burning or they are getting burned by a hot rock or other device. And that will lead to thermal burns. Severe wounds may require systematic antibiotic fluids because uh, through, through, through these wounds, you lose fluids either through dehydration or rather bleeding, too much bleeding. And analgesics when it's painful, like lidocaine, you could do a poor one even. Uh, superficial wounds may be managed topically with sulfadiazine cream. Rodent bites. Snake owners may leave a live rodent in a cage, and if the snake does not subdue it on its first attempt, the snake may retreat. Rodents in special rights may actually bite or even eat portions of the snake. Other than normal habits, it's because they, they are also fighting for their lives. Client needs to be educated on the dangers of feeding live food. So whenever it's uh, possible, you are advised to euthanize uh, these uh, rodents first before feeding. It's actually even a humane way of, 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 of administering the food. The snake's wounds should be treated openly with antibiotic ointments, and then severe wounds that are deep to the musculature level or into the salomic cavity should be treated with systemic antibiotics, fluids, and analgesics. Impaction, not common uh, in snakes, among snakes, but as I explained earlier, we've actually experienced one impaction case and it went on good, and the snake is now healthy and still alive. Usually due to improper cage substrate, corn cob, wood chips. So when we put this on the snakes, just like in, in, in poultry, you advise not to use wood chippings or other wood shavings in, the, in, the, in their cages because they'll tend to peck on the wood shavings and it will, when, when it gets to the, the intestines, it actually causes impaction. Becoming lodged in the gastrointestinal tract may require surgery, sometimes. Diagnosis is made from history, radiographs, and palpation. You should also you should actually add palpation. Sometimes it may be eminent or not, but when you palpate, you can actually feel the obstructing mass. Blister disease. The 
This problem is usually secondary to high humidity and poor cage hygiene. Snake will present with necrotic and inflamed ventral scales. The problem is frequently multifocal in many areas, many focal areas. Treatment includes correcting the environmental problems and treating the lesions topically with better solutions. As you can see, some of these conditions are, are, are almost brought up by, by poor husbandry conditions like environmental temperatures, humidity, so on and so forth, uh, hygiene. Severe cases may warrant the use of system, systemic antibiotics to prevent sepsis. The old damage scales may disappear with subsequent ones. So we have a, a case here called embryo stroke egg retention. It's seen in the egg laying pythons and live bearing balls. I haven't experienced this either. Hysterotomy or rather salpingiotomy and subsequent removal of eggs or other embryo, embryos is the treatment of choice. So this warrants for, 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 for surgical intervention. It may be possible to lubricate the oviduct with lubricating jelly and manually assist the removal of the egg or injecting oxytocin at a dose of three to 10 intentional units per kg before attempting surgery. So I bet uh, assisting in removing, removing the removal of the eggs just as we explained in impaction will help. So you just lubricate and gently massage uh, towards the extruding part. And you can also inject uh, oxytocin as, uh, at the stated dosage rate to help in contraction of the muscles. Radiographs will help with the location and number of eggs or embryos present. So radiograph is the recommended diagnostic technique. Prolapsed hemipenis. hemipenis. This condition may have a variety of causes. Prolapse may be unilateral or bilateral. If attended to quickly, a lidocaine gel may be applied at the organ reduced and the organ reduced manually. So in case of a prolapse, uh, you can actually apply a lidocaine gel. Number one, it will assist in, uh, number one, it will assist in reducing the pain because it's an analgesic. And it cause, and whenever there is bleeding because it actually contains adrenaline, there will be vasoconstriction and uh, reduced bleeding. So uh, something that uh, we failed to mention is that when the mass, when the mass is edematous or rather swollen, you first uh, soak a, a piece of cloth on warm water uh, mixed with a solute, either salt or sugar, and then it, it should be a clean, a clean, a clean piece of cloth, and then apply it on the extruded mass. What uh, that will help with, it will absorb some of the fluids, hence reducing the the, the extruded mass to actually a, a size that can be corrected. After that, you can apply a pasturing suture, that is a surgical intervention using either local anesthetic or general. This suture must allow for urinary and fecal wastes to pass and may be left in place for between two to three weeks. Gout, the deposition of urates in the kidneys other organs and joints is usually secondary to dehydration, but can be caused by primary renal or metabolic disease. So for the case of dehydration, when uh, there's dehydration due to all the reasons that we've mentioned throughout this presentation, uh, what is left in the, in, the, in the animal's body is the solute. So when these solutes are, are getting deposited on the kidney in terms of uh, as urates, they can lead to out. So that can be physiological, uh, physiological etiology or other cause, but it can also have uh, pathological through metabolic disease or primary renal disease. The tophi may be visible on radiographs. Proper hydration and balanced diet are the best way to prevent this disease. Osteoarthritis or osteoarthrosis. This is seen in several species of snakes caused primarily by salmonella bacteria, salmonella species. It is likely that the bacteria enter the bloodstream from the gut and then spread hematogeneously rather through the blood system to the bone. And then these, uh, this point emphasizes on the need to observe proper hygiene 
and uh, yeah, proper hygiene and maybe external conditions. Because when we get even 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 through 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 parasitism, we can get these parasites uh, that are actually attached to the walls of the intestines, causing lesions. So when they plaque or rather they get released, they, they leave a lesion that can act as a source or other route of infection. And then if we have a salmonella as one of the culprit bacteria, it goes through that route, hematogenously through the blood and then to the bone, leading to osteoarthrosis or osteoarthritis. Salmonella has also serious zoonotic potential. As stated earlier, some of these diseases are zoonosis, zoonotic, sorry. And proper hygiene should be emphasized to snake handlers and owners with pet reptiles. Welfare management of captive snake, what we do at IPR, case rate IPR. Inappropriate management practices are the main reason of stress and impaired health in captivity. Factors like temperature, humidity, enclosure size, crowding, all influence snake welfare, hereby restricting the physiological needs of the animal. Raising awareness of the effect of bad management on mental, physical and behavioral health is the key to improve welfare in captivity. We're just reiterating on what we've been saying. Snakes kept at KC Captivity are venomous. We, all the snakes that we have are venomous due to the nature of our research. And include, we have col colubrids such as twig snakes and boomslangs, viperids, gaboon viper, pafadas, anisorus vipers, carpet vipers, sabara bush viper, and elapids, cobras, mambas. In the cobras, we have Egyptian cobra, red, sp red spitting cobra, black naked spitting cobra, light brown spitting cobra, forest cobra, mambas, we have green mamba, or black mamba, East African gutter snake. And from the lamprophids, we have small scale burrowing. That is the mole viper. So uh, Geoffrey, our pathologist, actually has a, a good record for this, uh, an inventory for snakes whenever we have a new snake, whenever we have a new snake giving, uh, an existing snake giving birth. Uh, even if we encounter death, uh, he updates the inventory on, on, on a daily basis, rather when need arises. So these are images of, the, of some of the the venomous snake, the Naja Ashe, large brown spitting cobra. And it is important to know that they spit and they target the eyes. So your eye can be one of the targets and therefore one of the routes for, 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 for maybe subjecting the poison. So whenever you're handling Naja Ashe and other spitting cobras, you should always wear your spectacles as part of the PPE. Boom slang and the black mama during dropsis for lepsis. The snakes are kept at a uh, case capitarium free from other animals and excessive noise. The facility is always locked and only accessible to authorized personnel trained to handle snakes. Sealed against animal escape using screening to block all points of entry or rather exit, including the ceiling and air spaces under doors. So you notice uh, snakes are very flexible. So whenever you have a snake that has, a, has a, a ex escaped, especially, unfortunately, when you don't know it has escaped, it can actually go up the, the, the cage stalls, through the window, and outside the apartheidium. I don't need to emphasize on the importance of, of observing this practice, because you, you actually understand the havoc that that can cause, especially in a work setting, or rather in a home setting. They can even go through the, so the, the, the doors uh, leading to the, their cages, the, 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 the room doors, they usually, there's usually like a small space beneath the door. You should actually observe or rather uh, consider blocking all the space, not, li not leaving anything to chance because, because they are flexible, they can go through that space. The housing, snakes are housed in individual special cages that are well ventilated, clean, transparent, and always lockable. The cages are well labeled for easy identification of the individual snakes. So normally the cages are labeled the species name, the sex, the area of origin, and the date the snake was brought to captivity. And we have a record uh, for daily. Actually, in a day we take we take uh, temperature and humidity almost five times. 
especially when it's cold, we go even above five times. And uh, we have records, well-kept daily records uh, for their feeding and their, their health. Temperature at night and during the day, 2026. Celsius can be regulated by extractor or heat fans. Humidity, low, moderate or high, 30 to 65, can be modified using a humidifier. Light, 12 hour of light and dark cycle. Stocking density, one to two snake per cage, at most two, only two during mating. Yeah, as I stated, we, we have individual caging. So unless, uh, unless we want to effect mating, we keep them individually. Terrarium or other cage size per snake, you should consider the length, width, and the height, small to medium size, vipers, that is their measurement, small cobras and colubrids, that is their measurement, and the hatchlings, the small ones, that is their measurement. The ad ad adults are, are, are placed at, at casing, they are placed in fiberglass, that is custom at that measurement. So that is the image of their cages. This is actually case capitarium. So these cards hold their identification, as I stated, including the area of origin and date of origin. No individual cage heating place. The whole house has a general heating place. The snake are provided with hiding places in the cages. As you can see, uh, there are some balls, there are some bamboos that they can actually go within their hollow and twigs just to mimic external environment, as I stated. Yeah, we change these gazettes uh, on a daily basis, every day, every day, every day. Uh, this is water in a bowl. Yeah, so they hide in this, these two, basin, two basins. So hiding places in the cages, there are also twigs and climbing areas for some a barrel species. Substrate, most of the snake are provided with clean and dry, uh, dry and dry newspapers. Wood shavings and sand is discouraged as it harbors that bacteria are not easy to clean. The burrowing species are provided with some autoclaved sand on top of newspapers. It is easy to monitor the parasites and hygiene of newspapers. Feeding and water, clean fresh water is always provided for drinking. They are normally fed on frozen mice once a week, usually after cleaning. So, but but uh, so you can have uh, you can have a snake that uh, has released feces maybe a day after cleaning, even even if it if it weren't fed. So on need on need basis, we clean there cages. The cages are are cleaned on need basis. So we don't wait until it's it's the feeding time. It gets to the feeding time. Because some of these uh, uh, excretes can, can act as a source of infection, cleaning, and also to uphold their welfare concerns. During cage cleaning, the animals are removed from the cages safely using tongs or snake hook, transferred into a large plastic cage with a self locking lid. The cage, cages are cleaned frequently to remove moist newspapers and snake excretes. Disinfection of the cage is also done to prevent cross-contamination of and disease transmission. Breeding snakes in captivity. Eggs are collected once laid under the newspapers and placed in modified nest with heated soil and retained right moisture and monitored daily until they hatch, depending on the species. Some species like vipers give birth to live young ones. The cages are normally monitored once the hatchlings are seen, they are immediately transferred to the Cages. Indicators of diseases. Type of disease in snakes may be specific for a certain disease such as cottage cheese type, discharge in the mouth of snake with somatitis or non-specific. Most actually are non-specific, such as lack of appetite and lethargy, dullness, mouth breathing can be seen with many diseases like pneumonia, septicemia, so on and so forth. Any uh, any deviation from normal is a cause of concern and should be evaluated as soon as possible. So these are some of the references. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, now I'll open the floor to questions, which I'll be assisted, especially by Geoffrey, our chief pathologist. Thank you once more.
So if you have a question, you can raise your hand and then we'll be able to unmute you. And thank you, Robert, for the very informative talk. Welcome. Yes. So any questions? You can also use the chat room. Could I make a comment, please? Yes. Sure, sure, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm John Cooper in England. Um, yes. My wife and I have sent in a message on the chat to say thank you for a very interesting and well presented lecture and to mention how good it is to know that um, Kenya is once again taking the lead in herpetological medicine, particularly reptile medicine. Um, as um, Dr. George and others know, um, 50 years ago in the 70s when we first lived in Kenya, we introduced reptile medicine to the Nairobi Snake Park and to other collections and it was considered very strange then, but it did help put Kenya on the map. And um, of course, what Dr. George has described continues to do so. But we would also like to pay great tribute to Dr. Jessica Carreri, who over the past year has been doing some wonderful work. And um, really just to say Hongera to everyone and Mungo Aki Penda to Rudy Kenya Mwaka Ujayo. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, John. You're always welcome back to Kenya. And thank you for the good work that you started many years back. So do you have any other question or any other comment before we close? Any question? I can see uh, a comment from Brenda Wangui. In case of a snake injury, what is the advice that should be taken immediately in the face of occurrence? Is a question from Brenda Wangui. Uh, Gloria, um, uh, you know, this is a bit confusing because uh, uh, snake injury could mean injury to the snake or uh, does she mean um, injury to the human from snake bites? So let me just unmute her so that she can clarify what she means. Okay, my ready. question is yeah okay thank you um, my question is if the snake is injured not the person the snake itself what should be the immediate what should be immediately done to the snake before taking it away from the place of injury Uh, so I, unless Dr. George wants to respond to that, I'll go. I'll go first anyway. So uh, I assume you, you, you. What you mean is that uh, in case of an emergency injury to the snake, yes. what is it that you do? And again, uh, it's a bit uh, tricky because it will depend one on the type of injury. Two, you should always, always consider your health first. Are you sure the snake is venomous or not? It's your snake, uh, and you are in a position to restrain, just restrain. And if it's bleeding, just uh, ensure hemostasis or rather control for bleeding by applying pressure or rather 
blocking with a with a, with a, with a, with a clean piece of cloth, but ensure you don't uh, put a too tight tourniquet to interfere with the blood flow. Uh, if it's an infection, you can kill with a, you can clean with a mild antiseptics, but uh, we advocate uh, with a serious, serious, serious uh, recommendation that uh, you should always consult a veterinarian as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, Thank I've, you. Um, I've also seen a question from Helen. Helen, I've unmuted you. Please voice your question. All right. Um, right. Where is my question? Basically, I was just asking if you is if you still have the large pit at the snake park um, with with the snakes, you know, in that big pit with different snakes there. Or was, was that a different part of the reptile? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Jessica is online, I think. Uh, please the, respond to this. Yeah, I'll, I'll mute her so that she can be able to respond. <clears throat> Dr. Jessica, you're unmuted. Yeah. I think she has some network issues. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah. Maybe you can type in your answer, then we'll voice it out for you. Sure. Shailesh also had a question, so I've admitted him as we respond to the other question from Helen. Thank you very much. This is just, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. This is just a general question. Now, for a pet owner, do you need a license or a permit to keep a snake at home? And whom do you approach? to get one license. Thank you. Um, I can take that. Yes. As, uh, George speaking. Yeah, um, one does need a permit or a license to keep uh, any of the wild animals, uh, at least within Kenya. So the custodian uh, by the government is uh, Kenya Wildlife Service. So. Uh, in case one is interested, they can uh, always put in an application through the chief licensing officer, uh, the Kenya Wildlife Service, and the documentation process can begin. Thank you. Mm. We also have another question from Atubwa Howard. Is it wise to force feed a snake that has refused to eat? I saw something putting a mice in the snake mouth and put it with a faucet. Come again, please come again. Is it wise to force feed a snake that has refused to eat? I saw someone putting a mice in the snake mouth and pushing, push it with a faucet. So is it wise to force feed a snake? Yes, but it depends. If, if, if the snake only uh, has a anorexia, that is a, a, a poor appetite, with no underlying condition or no uh, digestive tract condition like impaction, then it is allowed because that's all what even we do. But uh, in the event of a uh, constipation or intestinal impaction, you could imagine for feeding uh, a snake that has impaction and the, 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 the feed can't go through. You are only adding more to the mass. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that response. I see Dr. Jessica has responded to Helen's question and she says, yes, the snake pit is still there. There's one more question from Barbara Ogori. Is there a natural ointment that, one's can, that one can apply in case you want to handle a venomous snake? A natural ointment. Thank um, you for that. <laughs> Sorry, Doc, we can go on. Can yeah, I can take that. Um, uh, we see a lot of claims to them, 
mostly from uh, traditional herbalists. Um, I guess we're, we're, it's uh, still, uh, you know, a developing scene where uh, we're testing this scientifically. But uh, as far as I know, um, I don't know if any that does work. Okay. Mm. I see another question from Rupi Mangat. She's asking, is the pet trade in Kenya rife? <laughs> uh, I guess from uh, a nature Kenya perspective, yes. um, uh, we also government, uh, um, I'm assuming everyone here is a conservationist. So um, really, uh, it's mostly these animals are to be maintained in their natural habitats as much as possible. Only when then um, we have to remove them there, then it's for it for a, to be for a very justifiable cause. Yeah. Uh, like for our case, of course, we are trying to uh, come up with antivenom that is effective, safe, and affordable for our people. Um, we've heard of illegal trading, uh, which is not okay. Uh, it's easy to smuggle some of these pets. Yeah? Uh, and uh, through KWS records, uh, there are very few people who I think are licensed to, to trade pets internationally uh, within Kenya. We have those ones that are licensed to keep them locally for touristic purposes. Uh, but then again, like I've said, uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, for us now, and especially uh, this global pandemic and uh, news coming in that uh, uh, it might have been from a wildlife, you know, origin, animal origin, then uh, we should keep the pets in their natural habitats as much as we can. I mean, the, 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 the reptiles, and in this case, snakes. Okay, thank you for that response. Um, there's a comment from Shailesh saying there's a good book called The Dangerous Snakes of Africa by Stephen Spalt and Big Branch. Thank you for that information. So I've, I've seen a, a, number, a good number of comments from people saying the presentation was amazing and quite informative. Very nice presentation, Dr. Robert. Thank you very much, and the IPR team. So I will take the the last uh, the last question from Helen Kenny. Is venom extraction here only for snake bites anti -ven anti venom, or is any used for other medical research? Following a recent doco on CNN documentary on CNN last week. Um, I can take that. Yeah, yes. um, we are currently focusing just on antivenom uh, because that's what uh, we have been permitted by the government and KWS. But uh, I think uh, uh, I saw that documentary and uh, uh, there's a lot of requests for us to engage uh, in other areas of research using venom and there are multitude of them. So yes, we will uh, consider those. But the other people, elsewhere in the world that are already undertaking this. Okay. So um, I think I will need to close the talk at this point. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. George and Dr. and uh, Robert for this talk. And thank you our members for creating time to join this informative talk. Thank you very much. I am Gloria Waswa, the Membership and Marketing Manager in Chakenya. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks.